it on public land. And ordinarily, he would have no hesitation if he saw a wolf near his sheep. But in the Wood River Valley of Idaho's Sawtooth National Forest, John Faulkner and other sheep ranchers are attempting a different approach toward keeping sheep and wolves apart without deadly bullets. With the help from the conservation group Defenders of Wildlife, Idaho Fish and Game, U.S. Forest Service, and U.S. Wildlife Services, the ranchers of the Wood River Valley have been testing their non-lethal techniques in what is considered the Sheep Superhighway of Central Idaho, patrolled as it is by the resident Phantom Hill Wolf Pack. On the hour, every hour, get up and turn my telemetry on, uh, see if there are any signals from the local wolves that have collars. And I'm uh, switching between the, the alpha male and the alpha female, which are the two wolves in the pack that have collars. Uh, I can only pick up signals from, from wolves that are wearing the, uh, the radio collars. Jesse Timberlake is the manager of the Wood River Project for the Defenders of Wildlife. As well as he must watch his sheep, Timberlake must watch his wolves. Last night, uh, there were wolves howling all around, uh, just on the, on the ridge above where the sheep were. So when they do that, then I, I get up and start walking around the sheep, making sure they're right. If the wolves keep on howling, then uh, I have an air horn, I might use to scare them away, or a little starting pistol. For more than a decade now, since wolves returned to the Rocky Mountains, the defenders of wildlife have been paying ranchers to compensate for their losses. Here in the Wood River Valley, where the losses were once more frequent, they've lately found that new precautions have largely precluded those payments. It's going to cost them more money to pay off us than what they're going to spend on their two people they had out with that one band over there. This year we didn't have any trouble over there but one. And they weren't there that night. Are they done? Uh, and the herder saw four or five wolves the next morning. Another collaborator in this groundbreaking experiment in non-lethal wolf control is Mike Stevens of Lava Lake Lamb, whose introduction to raising sheep in wolf country was a lesson never to be forgotten. In 2002, we had wolves uh, come into that sheep band in three successive nights, and they killed a total of 18 ewes and lambs. So that was a pretty big wake-up call for us. Then uh, we started implementing a number of uh, proactive measures at that time. And that turns on the alarm, which has this high-intensity strobe light and two speakers that have noise that changes. In a situation like this, it's just to alert the herder because the sheep are already in, they're not gonna be in this enclosure, but we wanna let the herders know you better get up because you got wolves close by, call it wolves. In the Northern Rockies, where some perceive wolves as the biggest threat to livestock, the facts tell a different story. Wolves have been found responsible for less than 1% of the region's sheep and cattle losses. Far more dangerous are disease and bad weather. Even the domestic dog, man's best friend, is recently on record for killing five times as many livestock as their wild cousin, the wolf. And so our view about wolves was that certainly they present some challenges for our operation, our sheep operation. We're running about 5,000 sheep over a very large area. But we also recognize that wolves are an important part of a fully functioning eco ecosystem. And so when we first found that we had lost sheep to wolves in 2002, our first instinct was, well, what is a way that we're gonna be able to coexist with these animals? And we have 
pretty successfully in all in all those years since 2002 through 2008 we've had zero depredations with the exception of 2005 and in every one of those years we've used some combination of approaches including use of telemetry really close communications with the agencies in order to understand what the wolf packs were doing uh, and then the use of flattery night watches etc to, uh, to deter the wolves from coming in. And we've had a number of instances where tracks uh, were seen or wolf howls were detected within a quarter mile or less of the sheep band. Wolves will continue to be present in the landscape. And so we believe that implementing these methods and approaches is necessary regardless of the legal status of wolves. And so it's been fabulous from the standpoint of people you know working together to come up with a single outcome of let's reduce the impact of wolves on on the sheep operations and then uh, subsequently reduce the impact of wolf control or predator control on the wolf population and to have just the loss of one sheep in a summer of grazing is is pretty remarkable whether it's wolves or bears or uh, mountain lions, other coyotes, other predators also live within the system too. And so it's been a you know, remarkably good uh, year for the livestock operators as well as for the wildlife, the, the predator populations. The Idaho experiment in coexisting with wolves comes at a time when top predator science increasingly confirms its far-reaching importance. Since their discovery of the wolves' healing role in Yellowstone, Bill Ripple and Bob Beshta have been exploring other ecosystems and finding similarly vital connections to their predators. Following the literary trail of Aldo Leopold, the two ventured to Zion National Park in Utah, where Leopold had warned of deer massing in destructive densities. It's just an incredible place as you look up at these valley walls. But as you begin to bring your eyesight down into the valley bottoms and you begin to look at what's happening along streamside areas, there's an ecological tragedy taking place today. And it's been going on for the last 60 to 70 years. That tragedy had ironically been triggered with the crowning of Zion as a national park in 1919. With the coming swarms of tourists went Zion Canyon's top predator, the cougar. And with its big cats all but missing came swarms of deer to Zion Canyon. Ripple and Beshta found an ecosystem badly wanting for more cougars. Every year, the large cottonwood trees in Zion National Park put out millions and millions of seed. And across the sandbanks or along the river margins, at least some of those will establish and grow. However, they get eaten off by the mule deer in the system, and they will reach this brushy stage here, but will never get any higher than this. Eventually, this plant will die. With the cottonwoods' death, the stream sides of Zion, like those of Yellowstone, began to crumble. And as they crumbled, they receded ever further from their life-giving forests. An insidious cycle of dying trees and sloughing stream banks, each feeding the demise of the other. So we disconnect the river from the streamside plant community. Any of the animals, such as the lizards, the toads, or the amphibians, that would normally use that habitat have a tough time living in those environments. In addition, the, the shade that these trees used to provide to the river has disappeared. The trees now are way back from the river, and we get direct sunlight into the river system. So we begin to affect aquatic species, such as fish, that live in these systems. But how to know if the missing cougar was ultimately at the root of Zion's problem? To Ripple and Beshta's good fortune, the park still harbored quiet sanctuaries, remote from the bustle of Zion Canyon. And one of those lay only nine miles away as the raven flies, in a place called North Creek. 
this place here is very remote. There's no cars, no roads, very few people get in here. Cougar are scarce in Zion Canyon, common here. As the two scientists set about their now familiar routine of measuring trees and stream conditions, it quickly became apparent that North Creek held a richness of life far greater than its trees. I walked up and down these banks and I took an inventory and put them in this notebook here as to what species I found, what wildflowers and uh, frogs, toads, lizards and butterflies and uh, we added all those up along the stream here and then we compared those with uh, Zion Canyon. The contrasts were nothing short of astounding. In their samples of North Creek, Ripple and Beshta counted 47 times as many cottonwood trees, five times as many butterflies. North Creek held as many as 200 times more toads and frogs. It harbored cardinal flowers and asters by the hundreds, where Zion Canyon harbored few. So these results are really dramatic. And we think this is linked back to uh, the presence of the cougar here and the way cougar prey on deer, and deer eat the plants, and then the plants are highly connected to the biodiversity and the food web. So one of the key points that we're finding for maintaining ecosystems is to have a presence of a top predator in the system, whether it's cougar in a mule deer system like Zion, or whether it's wolves in an elk system like, like Yellowstone National Park. The presence of that predator is crucial in maintaining that system through time. Ripple and Beshta would go on to research the role of top predators in more national parks, each drawing uncanny parallels to the other, each echoing the concerns of Leopold 60 years before. These supposed bastions of wild America, where, lacking their top predators, were destined to decay. Scientists from around the world now confirm Wildlands and oceans worldwide are falling under silent siege from within. Where they are missing their top predators, they are missing the key species that once sustained far richer, more resilient communities of life. Yet some of these wounded ecosystems still harbor hopes for healing. Amazingly enough, even at the dawn of an increasingly crowded century, we find unlikely wild land surviving. Grand, open spaces, perhaps still big enough to house the great beasts in numbers necessary to perform their vital role. But most promising of all, there is healing to be found in humanity's awakening spirit of compassion. With a few concessions to the great predators with which we once intimately shared this planet, a more vibrant and wholesome life on Earth could once again be ours. The mountains and canyons are calling for their wild hunters to come home. There may still be room enough out there, if there is room enough within the human heart.